Well, thank you very much. And it is enlightening to see so many people come worrying about what to do next. And of course, there is a, a thing with humanity from maybe over 4,000 years, and we had it really well pointed out that we've been messing it up for that length of time. And I had a group of good old scientists said to me, you know, we're using a similar farming philosophy, similar plants and animals to the Romans, and why do we expect to get a different result? Well, of course, that's all been said already. And the fact is that we get huge complexity. There's been some wonderful points made and pieces delivered today that are all very valid and all in very important. But what do we take away? Is there some simple series of processes that are guaranteed over time and area? The fact is that a lot of people who are good managers of land can produce great results. And this group of scientists said to me, you know, we can't rely on biodiversity. We can't rely on the assemblage of processes because we have zoos and we have bio, uh, botanic gardens. They cost a fortune to run and they'd fail within a very short time once we stop managing them. That's the warning signs. Why do we go? So what I'm now going to say is, see the photograph up there? That was the biodiversity at Mount Isa before humans came to this land. What a great thing it could do on its own. Automatically, powered by plants, energised by the sun, and gravity. There are three components. It's all been mentioned today, but I'm just simply adding to the fact that written in this landscape is a skeleton that I was able to recognise. And I've looked back through time as much as I can, and I know that the practical examples exist and the ability to interpret them to support any form of agriculture has already been proven. So along with all of the information that these people have been delivering today is an opportunity for a practical group of very qualified people to measure the processes of this landscape that went on for thousands of years and came up with the very best results on the planet with no natural climate backups. That's the biggest single point. We are in the privilege of having the oldest land in the world. It's three and a half billion years old when you get west of here. And it had the privilege of evolving all the flowering plants, the singing birds, and two thirds of the fish species. It's a unique platform on which to build the evidence you've all seen today. But what I'm trying to say is the skeleton of it is still in this landscape. We'll never repeat the landscape, but we can repeat the efficiencies and the processes and functions that that landscape had in it. Now, in that effort, we can look at the solar powered plants. We go to a desert and the temperature varies 70 degrees a day, which means the sun's energy is not being managed. When the plants use water, they turn that to latent heat, which we know is not active. And therefore, the storms, all of the things that we are now suffering from, were once managed by plants in the previous picture in this landscape. So naturally, all of you who can grow a plant will contribute to the outcomes that we want. And this group of scientists, after I'd had them out here, they looked at the landscape and we went and looked at various pieces of the skeleton that was there, spent four periods of 10 days. After the second time, they wrote a letter to John Howard saying, the Australian land managers, you people, will lead the world when you understand how this used to work. So I was talking to a physicist here a few days ago, 
and we had a little group of people at a table and I said, well, here, this fellow will explain all about climate change and so on. So he went off and he told us about how the stars move and the sun and all this other stuff. And I said to him, well, that's good science. We know all that. But what percentage influence would it have on the climate? Oh, I don't know about that, he said. Well, I said, I'm only an old mug farmer, but what I would do is go and sit in a rainforest for a while, measure the temperature and the climate change, and it probably would go through 15 degrees. Then I'd move out into this other country, and it would go through 70 degrees or more. To me, that's climate change. You're right, he said, and got up and walked away. So what we can do very easily is realise that everything recycles, every living process that's a result of plant production has to be recycled. If we thought about it carefully, if that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here because we've been told how biodiversity, all of the compounds are still essential for the function of our whole body. And as we reduce the number of species of plants, there's a limit to the time which the reserves in that system will maintain us. And now we've got to start to understand that Australia is the comeback king from these devastating cycles. I mean, the Bylong Valley, for example, was first occupied in 1820, or our first surveyed, so it was occupied sometime before then. By 1900, it had the largest herd of shorthorn cattle in the valley. And then, I guess, the Belize who set it up would have been back probably in England in the smoke room and they knew that there was Chinese coolies out of work from the coal, other gold mines. And they said, we'll double the herd, go and clear all of that area so that they cleared the whole of Bailong, which gave us a very early example of what the catastrophe has happened generally across the landscape. But this is the most important piece. It's come back at least five times since that period. And some of the things that happened that I still find quite difficult to get people to understand, uh, um, Herbert Thompson started a horse study in 1915. And then by the late 30s, he had Heroic, the leading sire, and then 14 other stallions. Now you're all gonna get upset about this, what happened, because there were no roads in and out of Bylong from the better parts of Australia, and there was no track to Sydney, that beautiful country of the quarry marshes and Coolar and so on used to get huge numbers of stock. As soon as it got a bit dry, they all went into the Hunter because it was the only place they could export them from. So the Hunter was desertified, certainly by 1903, when a flood happened and it took every tree out of the river, right from Denman to the coast. Happened again in 1920, again in 1950. So if you go into the Hunter now, you'll see a few bridges, a lot of them are rebuilt, but there's a piece of bridge and there's a bit on this end and a bit on that end, where the river expanded from 30, 40 yards wide at the most, to 300 yards wide. And there's a ride up sent back to England in uh, 1860 of this couple going down the river between Warpeth and Singleton saying, the banks were an impenetrable barrier of thickets, but occasionally there was a clearing where they could look out from the river at the fields, at the farmlands. All of these things are pieces of that puzzle that I'm asking us to think about carefully, recognise that it was automatic, and therefore we can all afford to do it because it was powered by sunlight and gravity and managed by plants. Anyone who grows a plant will contribute to this, but we're not going to repeat ancient Australia. We're going to build a new Australia, better than it ever was, if, in fact, we get this up. There is a thing that I think we could promote. And big John Fry just talked about these things, and he says there's 170,000 people Unemployed in the bush, we got a drought and, and crisis happening. Some years ago, I went 
to the peacocks who were in charge of the elected members in Dubbo and said, if we grew wetland plants in the flow lines, the eroded flow lines, because since then I've been building processes and examples of how that can be done. And then we move them out to where we manage water. Now the thing is, the plants gradually grew from a water body across the landscape. So they managed the whole landscape water system. We've ruined it. It's no longer there. So what I'm suggesting, and we'll pull on all of these people to contribute, is that we've got a 60% greater runoff, definitely, today. So we need to manage in the top sections of our land 60% of the water, because the processes works when we get it set up that the landscape is developed to its maximum. There's high density growth on the ridges. And then that drops 7% of its mass, so that feeds down and then that fertility allows grass to outcompete most other plants. So we end up with grasslands. And anyone can do that, it was mentioned today, good women, good gardeners, do it. They put mulch and they run their garden. And I often say to farmers, you know, and I haven't been as good as my friend here delivering all this, but I would say, what's the worst weed you have in your garden? But I first ask, who's a mulch farmer? And you get a couple of people say, I am. What's the worst weed you have? Oh. What about grass? Yes, it's grass. Well, tell these guys, they can't get it to grow. <laughs> <clears throat> but we think it's funny, but it's true, you know, unfortunately. And I mean, I can show you that if we can set a system up where we grow the filtering system in the creeks and the flow lines, any of the flow lines, which are then considered to be the farmer's best hay paddock, and he moves that material to where he's started to control a percentage of the water on his property. And there's a very important piece of that puzzle. It's got to show that it can sort of manage no erosion and maybe 60% of the normal rainfall, but we always get excessive fall. So it's got to have a capacity to manage an unlimited amount of water. And that's another pattern that this landscape has in it. And then below that, he can put the vegetation that he grew, filtered from the creek or the flow system, below that. And he could, if he's a reasonable manager only, have nine tonnes in one year from the one tonne that we started with, suppose it's John Fry and all these people around the city, tailwater systems. That would make us carbon negative immediately and free billions of dollars worth of money that's now going to somebody else. Thank you very much. <laughs>